Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Day. Um, I'm chairman and founder of State of Flux. I'll give you a bit of background on the company, and then we'll, uh, we'll go straight into managing risk and driving innovation through technology, which seems to be some pretty hot topics from, from what I've seen this morning. Um, and happy to share some of our experiences. Um, I'll probably pick on the risk guru in the room, Mr. Wild Goose there, as well, as we go through, or at least use some of your data, Nick. Um, so State of Flux is, is a, a procurement consulting, training, and technology organization. And we really focus on three things. Uh, supplier relationship management, contract management, and uh, uh, category and strategic sourcing. I think the big thing that we're, we're known for, um, was there's some of the clients that we work with around supplier relationship management, and, and that's really what we're, we're known for um, globally, is what we do around supplier relationship management, helping organizations put SRM programs in, embedding them in the change management. And we do that through as I said, consulting, training, and technology. The other thing that we do is each year we do an annual piece of research on what's best practice around supplier relationship management. Um, we've been doing it for seven years, as the stats say. Uh, we've had 1,200 different companies involved in that time. We've got about half a million data points on what makes good SRM. Uh, so this is the latest copy. You've probably seen it on our stand downstairs. Please make sure you get a copy. Um, but it certainly gives you a lot of, uh, lot of background information. And, and this year, we wrote it on why SRM rather than the how. Last year, or well, the previous report, uh, which is called The Journey to Customer of Choice, was written about how. This one was more written on the why. And the reason we did that is so that you can put it on a CEO's desk and explain why you're, why you're needing to do SRM, what value will they get from it. Um, so that's, that's what we've written. Hence, it's a lot smaller than the 200-page uh, document we'd written the uh, previous year. So I'm going to use some of the stats that we get from these pieces of research. Um, I'm more than happy to take questions throughout. I'm also going to use some of the, the uh, stats from Zurich's research on, on risk management as well. Uh, to give you a bit of background. And then finally, I'm going to take you through how we've used technology to, to try and answer those questions. And as I said, I'm more than happy to take questions throughout. Um, in terms of the latest survey, uh, and the 2016 survey will open uh, beginning in May. So if you're keen, make, again, make sure you pass your contact details on, and we'll get you involved in the, the research. It's, it's free to, to participate. But, this is, the, um, this is the stats around it. You can see sort of Europe um, and North America are the key focuses there, although we get quite a lot from Australasia as well. And part of that is where we have offices, um, but part of that is shows you where, what parts of the world are, are more mature in supplier relationship management. And I think it's worth touching on that um, because often you see confusion around what SRM actually is uh, and what it means. Um, you get anything from what time does the golf game start through to which performance management metrics should we use and how do we drive harder performance with our suppliers. For me, it's around systematic management of those suppliers to drive value. So you would segment your suppliers you would come up with different treatment strategies based on that supplier, supplier segment, um, as opposed to confusing it between, I've seen all sorts of things today from compliance management to performance management. Um, for me, all of those are important, but the key thing is to make sure that you've got a systematic approach to each level within your segment. Um, so what we looked at was, uh, what are the key reasons to implement SRM? And really what we've seen over the time is there's really three key reasons an organization would embrace an SRM program. One is to save money, and there's a great, um, Hewlett Packard has done a great slide showing their strategic sourcing savings declining over, over a five year period, and their SRM savings increasing. I'll touch more on finance, because, because there's multiple streams to where you get your money from 
with an SRM. So let me come back to that. <laughs> Clearly, risk is a key factor, and I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, are, are pretty interested in that. And again, I've got some stats on that, so I'll touch on that and, and go through some of the stats with you. And then finally, innovation is the other one that we'll, we'll touch on and how you get access to innovation. And what we've seen is that, that the motivation for the focus of SRM actually changes from organization to organization and sector to sector. So clearly, if you're in a regulated industry around, let's say, financial services, risk is going to be pretty high on your agenda. Whereas what we're seeing is a lot of the CPG companies are focusing more on innovation. And that's not to say that you wouldn't do the other two, but you just get a different flavor depending on what sector and what industry you're in. So, but those are really the three very high-level reasons. So if we touch on the finance side of things, so again, why are you implementing SRM? What we've seen is, and I, I said I'd use some of Nick's data and some of ours. Also, we, we work with Dr. John Henke, who's an American professor, done 25 years of research on SRM, uh, mainly around the automotive industry. And what's really interesting for... Um, from what John's research shows, is contribution to profit. Uh, so what John's seen is the better the supplier relationship, the more contribution to profit that you get from your suppliers. And that's huge. In the automotive industry, and granted, suppliers are a huge makeup of their external spend, um, their contribution can range from sort of 30 to 70% of their profit comes from suppliers. And John's seen a correlation between better relationship and more profit. So if you're struggling for business case, that's pretty compelling. Um, we've seen other parts of it, post-contract benef benefits, um, and I'll flick on to the next slide for that. But what we're seeing is most companies are getting about 4% if they're doing it. Leaders are twice, SRM leaders are twice as likely to get that 4%. Um, it's, it's sort of the average for the SRM leaders is 4 to 6% post contract benefit. Um, and that number's been pretty consistent over the seven years of research. So it's, it's, it's pretty compelling on that side of things. I'll just go back a bit. Um, we also seen two other reasons on the finance side that you would, you would look at. One is that it sustains your sourcing savings. And there's three studies out there that talk about how much of your savings that you do. So all the hard work that your teams are doing around strategic sourcing. Um, as I said, there's three studies. <laughs> one says 30, one says 50, one says 80. Take your pick. But let's, let's say 30% taking the lowest one these studies are saying 30% of the value that you're achieving through strategic sourcing is not translating to the bottom line. Now, it's a tough one for your SRM business case because you've already counted that, that number once in your sourcing savings, but it's, it is very compelling if you said, well, of all the effort that we've put in, a third of it is not going to the bottom line. And that's through either poor implementation, changing business requirements, and so on and so on. But, you know, it's a, it's a fairly large number. Add on to that your 4% and your contribution to profit, and the SRM business case is starting to get fairly easy. Um, the fourth one is what we call customer of choice benefits. And these are things like access to the A-team, priority access to scarce resource, Access, uh, so what we've seen there is leaders are twice as likely to get access to the A team, twice as likely to get access to scarce resource, uh, twice as likely to get preferential pricing, four times as likely to get new innovation. So very difficult to put a number around those things, but we know that there's a benefit, and intuitively I'm sure you, you will get it from that perspective. Um, risk management was was the next area that we, we focused on. And some of these, as I said, I'm going to use some of Nick's data here from his great piece of research. You can see that 18% uh, of organizations through their research 
claim losses of greater than a quarter of a million euros through a supply chain event. So it's fairly compelling in terms of the number on there. And again, 72% don't have full, percent, uh, full visibility of their supply chain, 72% of organisations. Um, what I found interesting when I was going through the research was, you know, everyone talks about, well, what's going on in tier two, tier three suppliers, and how do we manage those? From what Nick's, or the Zurich research says, is half of the disruptions are coming from tier one. So, which we should have visibility on. Um, what our research says is 80% don't have robust risk management processes in place for their strategic suppliers, let alone all the rest. The question we asked is, do you have robust strategic, uh, sorry, robust risk processes in place for your strategic suppliers? And only one in five said yes. And again, that's been pretty consistent over the seven years of research. So there's a huge opportunity, everyone, for managing these and taking a lead within your organization to, to embrace this. Um, we think there's three ways of dealing with supply chain risk. And it's pretty simple. You can manage it. You can talk to Mr. Wild Goose in the front here and get Zurich to insure it or some, someone else. Hopefully not someone else now. Um, or you can accept it and live with it. As you can see, 40% insure against it, and I'm pretty sure they don't insure all of it. So most of the time, they're living with it or managing it. And that's assuming they've identified it, right? I'll come back to how you're going to manage that risk in, in a few slides. I just, I just want to run through the next piece, which is the data on innovation. Um, so pretty much, when, I, when we look at our survey results and we say, look, is supplier innovation um, important to you? I can only remember one response that said no out of everyone. Everyone else said supplier innovation is key. You know, now that we're sort of hopefully coming, coming into a growth period, and you get people like Unilever talking about we, we want to double in size and we, we're really going to leverage supplier innovation to do that. Um, and, and quite often you're hearing about supplier-led supplier innovation and all that type of buzzword that's going on. What we saw through the survey is 10, only 10% 10 um, manage or communicate innovation. And that's, some of that's really simple, like what, what is innovation for you and your organisation? Has, has anyone here defined what innovation means for them and their organisation? It's um, a show of no hands. So um, uh, has anyone, <laughs> well, given the first question, I'll know no one has uh, actually communicated that out to their supplier base. But what we've, what we've seen is, you know, you get to the end of the year and you go, well, in the contract it says, I'm supposed to get four innovations from this supplier. Where are they? And the supplier says, well, we gave them to you. And, and, and there's, there's a debate around, well, no, that was a sales pitch, not an innovation. Um, and, and so there's a kind of mismatch of expectation. For me, what do we expect if we haven't defined it? So I think there's, a, again, a huge opportunity f on, on that side of things to do something simple like define what innovation means to you. Um, the communication side of it's huge. You get a lot of, and I'm sure all of you have done these supplier innovation days and uh, ideation events and things like that, and they're great fun. Um, but I do think we can communicate a lot better. There's nothing worse from a supplier to give an innovation to an organization and then it goes nowhere. Or it might have gone somewhere, but you just don't know because you haven't heard anything. Um, and there's, if, if you get a chance, there's a great uh, kind of webinar on, on our website from Dom Tribe at McLaren, or now ex-McLaren. But um, uh, Dom talks about 
how, how suppliers, you get the supplier fatigue and learned helplessness of suppliers after you give them innovation and don't hear anything, why would you waste your time? I'll go and give it to someone that wants it. So for me, again, there's a whole communication piece, and, and that's both around what we call challenge-led innovations and open-led innovations. And again, I'll come back to that. Um, and then the final piece is just making sure that we're really connected up between what's in the contract, what's in the performance metric, and what's in the relationship, so that, so that those metrics are all aligned to support innovation. Is there any questions so far? Anyone want to challenge stats or lies? lies? Uh, 4%, just to be clear though, you're talking about total contract value, right? So it's 4% over and above. Yes, absolutely. So you, if you spent 100 grand with someone this year, um, you should be able to take four grand off it, theoretically. Um, so I wanted to just talk about how we've been using technology to, um, to answer some of those questions. And, and what we've tried to do is align the technology to what we're seeing through the research and what feedback we're getting from clients. I'm not saying this is the be-all and end-all, but I just want to make sure you've got an example to, to see how we, we've approached it, basically. Um, so nine years ago, we... Uh, we were approached by cable and wireless to do an SRM project. And we did the project, and, and out of the back of it, they said, could you automate it? So um, we came up with what's now called State S, uh, our SRM technology. And, and basically, we're trying to drive a number of, number of events. One is around how do you get a consistent supplier experience. So think of, in your organization, all the effort that goes into customer experience what effort goes into supplier experience. And if I'm dealing with you here, or in the Middle East, or wherever, am I going to get a very similar experience when dealing with your organization? And all of these are important to make sure that you drive that customer of choice piece. Um, we've been using it as a single area of focus for organizations. So it sort of helps define SRM, and it helps define standardization. To, again, coming back to that consistent supplier experience. Um, those of you who may have heard me speak before, we talk about the six pillars of SRM, and normally those six pillars are implemented in, in running order, shall we say, with technology being pillar five. Recent changes we've seen is people are pulling technology forward and using that as a change catalyst to invoke kind of more, more focus around SRM. So you can do that. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone who, who wants to think about how they're going to do that. But I do think there's, there's a whole visibility piece. So we built the system, you know, data integrity is a challenge for every organization. So basically, we built the system so 70% of the data gets uploaded by the supplier, and you use it as a collaboration system. So that, that's how we've sort of we managed to get it wrong and try and, and deal with it. Um, as I said, when, when I compare this to what the research says, so the research here is we ask people what are the benefits of using SRM technology, and you can see one place to manage suppliers is said by nearly 70%. Big focus on supplier performance improvements, um, the whole information management, and so on and so on. So these are the results from the survey that back up how we've approached it. Um, I mentioned that we've done nine, nine years of, of development on it. I won't, I won't major on it. Really, I want to show you kind of what we've built into it and then how we use it for managing that. So it, it contains these multiple modules, um, and, you, and we'll focus predominantly on risk, performance, and innovation, just to give you those examples. Um, so in terms of supplier risk management, we focus on four areas, really. Um, one is around the riskiness or vulnerability of the supplier. So how do you know that there's going to be a disruption within your supply chain? How do you know that that supplier is not going to go out of business, that there's not going to be a geopolitical incident, and so on? So what we try and do is track all of those events. And often the, you, you will use multiple... Uh, sources of data 
someone like Dun & Bradstreet to help you with your finance side of things, someone like Echo Vardis or Sedex to help you on, on your CSR side of things. So that supplier riskiness or vulnerability is, is a key piece. And we try and pull all of that in to give you that vulnerability view of the supplier. Then there's just general relationship risks and issues. So you're going to deal with the supplier on a daily basis. How do you, how do you track what risks and issues are happening within the organisation? Because if, if you've got a supplier that's very risky and you're talking to the business about doing collaborative innovation or joint go-to-market, the first thing they're going to say is, yeah, but let's sort out this risk that's going on. And if you're not aware of it and you're not managing it, it's, it's quite a key piece. Accreditations and compliance, that's pretty simple, but that's, it's, it's, and we're certainly seeing it in the financial services sector where managing all the supplier data or, or supplier master data management, as some people just call it, that, that is quite a key feature, and I know some of the financial services will potentially get fined if they're not doing that. So that becomes a key driver for them. For me, it's just one part of risk uh, and making sure they have the right health and safety data to work on site or the right ISO accreditation or so on and so on. You need to manage it. It's, it, uh, it's a key piece. The fourth bit is around how are they managing risk on your behalf? because they have their own supply chain. And all the things that might disrupt them in the first one will potentially disrupt all their suppliers. So how are you getting visibility on how, how well they are managing their suppliers? So we've tried to take all of those, and um, hopefully you can see, see that down the back. But, um, and we've basically built it into a tabular form. So you can run through a risk overview where you look at your vulnerability and so on. You can run through the process assessment, so effectively how, what, what are your suppliers' risk processes like. You can run through your risks and issues, have your contingency plans and so on. Um, and again, remember this is collaborative, so the supplier can raise a risk on you as well. Um, the other one that we've looked at is around innovation. Uh, and our, we actually built this together with LV, actually, who went up for both a SIPS and a, and a Procurement Leaders Award on, on it. Um, but again, what we've tried to do is define and communicate what innovation means. Um, it allows you to add a challenge-led innovation. So what I mean by that is if you have a need or a problem, you can post that and push it out to selected suppliers or groups of suppliers or all your suppliers to say, could anyone help, or has anyone got a good idea on how we address this need or this challenge? And you need a different process on those challenge-led than you do on what we call open innovations and continuous improvement. So to me, those challenge-led innovations are really exciting, um, because if you then factor it in with what we call prospective suppliers, so i.e. people that want to work with you but don't yet, you can use that to crowdsource innovation. So for me, that's re really quite taking it to the next level. Um, open innovation is when a supplier has a good idea. So it's not, it's not driven by you. It's the supplier thinking, gosh, we've worked with A, B, and C Co for so many years. They keep asking us for a three-legged chair, and our factory's set up for a four-legged chair. If they change the spec of what they're buying, they'd save X, Y, and Z. Or if they did something differently, it would make their business so much more efficient. And to, to me, those are gold dust. You know, no one's asked the supplier to do it. They've come to you because they, you know, you have a sense of loyalty often, and they want to actually give you a good idea to work on. So again, how you manage those and the process behind it, and how you track it and communicate is pretty critical. And then cl clearly, continuous improvement works in the same way. Um, but I can't stress enough the whole need for communicating back to suppliers about how well they're doing, where the innovation's going, what's happening to the innovation, who's dealing with it. All key, key factors. A any questions on that? So what, what we've done is, again, built, built tabs here where we've got an area to place video clips around what is innovation, defining it, and then you've got the challenge-led innovations where you can choose and post innovations 
uh, and then, and then uh, where, where the supplier actually logs those innovations on. Yeah. How do you stop it? Something that kind of rubs with regards to, you talk about innovation, it's often relationship based and people getting in rooms and chatting, you, you're kind of putting it onto this SRM platform. How do you stop it becoming a tick box, tick box exercise as opposed to something that actually drives value, which often you know, happens over a beer or over a meal or you know, in a face to face relationship? Yeah. Yeah, this, it's a good point, and I think, if, again, if you talk to McLaren, they, they say innovation isn't normally a kind of light bulb moment. It's a series of steps of continuous improvement. Um, but, but certainly, um, what we try to do is, there's often a, just a mass of ideas coming through. Um, so the way we've done it is define it that when they actually log an idea, it has to, they, they, they have to show how it's going to add value to the business. And if it doesn't, then, then it's very clear, clearly going sort of exit stage left, if you would. Um, it's not perfect. Um, and, and we're not talking about ideation of an innovation. So we're not trying to facilitate the workshops to go through it. We're really trying to capture the ideas and facilitate that um, or facilitate the discussions around the challenge. Um, do you yeah. being very, very targeted with which suppliers you do this with, as opposed to saying all your tier one and tier two suppliers? Is it very, very targeted which you do and which you don't? It, 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 it dep the answer is it depends, um, and it depends on the innovation as opposed to... So what you would have is everyone in the program, but if you have a challenge, you clearly, depending on the challenge, you'd post it to some suppliers and not others. Um, you know, the way Toyota do it is they group suppliers together and get them to work on a problem. And you, you do a similar thing there, where you may post it to a group of suppliers and say, how are we going to do, do that? Any other questions? I'm just conscious I've, I've had a wave on time, so we've, we've got to kind of quickly race through the last couple of slides. Um, the last one I said I'd mention is around how you manage supplier performance data. And to get this right, is absolutely critical. Um, and where it gets tricky is actually you want to align your KPIs to the contract. So if you're sitting there saying, but hold on, we want 10 KPIs for our business, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize, but I'm going to tell you you're wrong. What you want is to align your KPIs to whatever's in the contract, which should be different for each supplier. But then you want the ability to normalize it and roll it up or down. And normalize, the way we've approached normalizing those is percentage to target. So every KPI should have a target and you, and you normalize it to that. And then, you, you, as I said, you can roll it up and down. But it does get, if you're doing it properly, it should get very granular um, on your KPIs. And, and hence why you'll roll it up to the top level. Um, and the way we've done it is we also align it to ISO 9000. So you can do things like corrective actions and preventative analysis on that. So it is fairly geeky and you are getting into the world of big data at the lower level, but certainly at the high level it's around normalization. So I should then be able to compare, excuse me if any of these organizations are in the room, but say IBM's data with, I don't know, um, Babcock's data uh, at an operational level, I can roll them up and look at who's better at managing quality. So for me, getting that right is really tricky, and from a technology point of view, it's very complex. Um, but it's, it's critical to make sure that you cover off that first part of it, which is, are we getting what we paid for, that 30% that got leaked from doing the deals? Um, and, and ultimately, you want to roll it up into a graphical format, because no one at an exec level is going to want to look at the detailed data. Uh, so, so that hence why we do that, and, and uh, but but getting it right to the bottom level is quite critical. Uh, and you can see, really, it's about how you how you input the data as well, and making it nice and easy for people to do that. So those three things are designed to cover off that that, that assurance around financial side of things. Are you getting what you paid for, the risk and the innovation? And that's how we've approach it. And in terms of the technology, there's a lot more that we've done. So I did, I did include other slides like, um, for me, hand in hand with performance data, you should look at perception. So there's one thing around, do they hit the KPIs? But if no one likes working with the supplier, then probably you're going to kick them out. 
or the execs love working with them and everyone on the ground thinks they're awful, there's going to be an interesting discussion where they're looking to give them more business and, and the people on the ground are saying, can we please kick them out, or vice versa. So um, what we've done on the tool is enable that kind of uh, 360 degree review, which then gives you the focus. We've, we've also uh, done, we've aligned the contract. So if I come back to clear visibility around what's in the contract, the performance and the relationship, I think that's very important to get those aligned. Um, uh, and then I mentioned earlier accreditations and compliance and the ability to track, audit, manage those. It seems to be a pretty hot topic at the moment. And then finally, CSR, again, pretty hot topic, but managing all of those. And what, what we've done, uh, Sky TV actually use SEDEX to help them with CSR, and then we, we pull that data in and turn it into a performance scorecard, which is pretty exciting. Sorry, I think, I think they've dropped the TV, so Sky, um, do that. Um, and then finally, you're clearly, you've got to report on all of this, so you want to be able to create dashboards and so on. So that, that's how we've done it. So again, we, we started this nine years ago. Um, you know, we, the first few were projects on the back of SRM, and then we've really turned it into a piece of technology. And it's driven around a few things, around supplier account management. So what do you need at your fingertips to manage that, that relationship? Um, and then also, how do you drive that consistency or that standardization so that you're getting that consistent supplier experience? So those are the two things that we, the two questions that we were trying to solve. Um, but that hopefully gives you a bit of a snapshot. For me, technology on its own doesn't answer everything. Uh, clearly, your people need to be well trained. Their jobs need to be defined. People know how to, need to know how to manage them. And your processes need to be aligned to what you're doing there. But hopefully it's given you a bit of a snapshot into how we're using technology to support SRM and really cover off those three key drivers behind what, what SRM is. Um, any questions or final comments or anything else people would like me to touch on? Yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. You talked about um, from your experience of rolling out the SRM models, how do you, how do you find it works with your, your segmentation model? Do you Customize it depending on what tier or the right across. You know, how, how you get that? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of the technology, absolutely. Depending on what segment they get, um, they change the, the the headings that they can see. So clearly, you wouldn't do a 360 review on every supplier, but you probably do it on tier one, maybe some of tier two. Um, so yeah, we do that. I think there is still a challenge around people's segmentation models. Um, but we've built the technology to align it to, to the segmentation. And in fact, you can do the segmentation in there as well. I think just a couple of comments on segmentation. Please, when you are doing it, uh, people don't confuse category segmentation with supplier segmentation. They are distinctly different. Um, and, and really, the output of supplier segmentation should be uh, what are the different t treatment strategies that we're going to use on, on the respective suppliers. Um, we find that you should use between 10 and 15 different criteria, the most common being spend and risk or criticality. But things like suppliers' willingness to work with you is pretty key, or do they see you as a key supplier? Uh, sorry, a key customer is, is key as well. So getting that segmentation right is, is pretty important. And then ensuring your treatment strategies are aligned to each of those segmentation criteria. And then we've built the technology to make sure it aligns to those treatment, treatment strategies. Any other questions, comments? Um, as I said, there's copies of these downstairs. Please feel free. They're, you know, they're free. If, if you want to make sure that you get involved in the, the, uh, the 2016 SRM study, please make sure you pass, out, pass your details on and we'll, we'll make sure you get the, the survey. The survey normally takes about sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, and on that we can then break out your results and tell you how you compare uh, with, with leaders and followers around SRM. So, thank you.